Lecture 21, Condition Variables, Monitors, and Atomic Types. Okay, so we've got at this point a pretty good toolkit for dealing with a lot of the scenarios that we are normally going to deal with. We have uh, learned about the semaphore, we've learned about the mutex, uh, we've discussed readers, writers, locks, we know... Uh, how to use all those things, and we know how to apply them in some different scenarios, uh, and we've covered a whole bunch of scenarios as you know, sort of patterns for uh, how these constructs can be applied. What this topic is about, in contrast to the previous ones, is the idea of uh, some more advanced tools. There's usually uh, no strong requirement to use these things, um, you know, for, for example, like with atomic types, we'll see it's an optimization of something that we already know how to do. Um, and in other cases, uh, the thing we want to do is perhaps a shortcut, um, but we're not, strictly speaking, requiring them in every situation. They're higher order things. They build upon what we already know. We could do what we need with the tools we already have. With that in mind, you know, you could say to yourself, well, you know, uh, why should I, you know, use a power drill when I could just use one of those manual ones, you know, like they did in the 1800s. Uh, and, you know, for a simple job, maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, for a you know, very large uh, construction project or anything like that, uh, you will quickly discover that you want the power drill. Oh, please, anything but doing this by hand. Uh, and so these uh, tools are useful, and we're going to learn about them, and we should be able to use them and understand what they're good for and, and what their uh, use cases are uh, and apply them, uh, but keeping in mind that uh, they're not the most basic tools. So we'll start off with condition variables. Uh, and uh, condition variable is uh, conceptually not that different from a condition statement uh, along the lines of, you know, wake me up when Monday is over. Um, this one's always uh, a little better, of course, when it actually is a Monday when this lecture is delivered, but, you know, maybe you're watching it on a different day, so... Um, but condition variables are a way of achieving synchronization, uh, and the idea is... That, you know, we are going to be notified when a certain condition is fulfilled. So, okay, um, that's a little more complicated than it sounds. It builds upon the idea that we've already talked about with signaling. Uh, when I said uh, we had the behavior of Alice and Bob, you know, Alice gets to the power plant and Bob leaves the power plant and all that is controlled by them you know, communicating with one another. Uh, and there is a certain amount of... Um, wake me up when this condition is fulfilled in that example because you know Bob is at his desk and cannot go home until Alice sends him a signal that's you know similar to the concept that we want to talk about here but we're going to improve on it a little bit right now so yeah um, suppose there is some condition doesn't really matter all that much what it is but you know we're waiting for this thing to be the case Know, waiting for everything to be ready, waiting for something to be done, waiting for users to say go, whatever it is, you know, we have a condition. And if a condition is fulfilled, one of the ways that we can indicate that that is the case is signaling. So, you know, post on a semaphore. So you have a thread that's waiting on a semaphore um, and you can then post on it and go. Another thing that you could do is you could use the semaphore uh, approach uh, or the mutex approach. So with the mutex approach, you lock a mutex, you know, read the state of variable and unlock the mutex. That's not great either. Um, I guess if, you know, should a thread decide to do this, well, I know it should lock the mutex and read the variables and then you know, make a decision based on that and then unlock the mutex. Um, sometimes that's okay, but Sometimes we are using more constructs than are necessary. Sometimes we are um, waiting for things or checking repeatedly for things that are only a rarely true. Uh, and it would actually be better if someone just told us, hey, this is the case, rather than having to check and then deciding, oh, wait, never mind. And that leads us to the condition variable. So you can think of a condition variable as being a kind of event that, you know, when this is the case, then the event occurs. And the thing that really makes a condition variable different from a 
semaphore is the concept of broadcast. So when you signal a semaphore, you know, you are sending a message and you're saying, hey, you know, uh, to one other thread, if any is waiting, you're allowed to sort of wake up and become unblocked. Okay. Um, or alternatively, if the thread hasn't arrived there yet, it can proceed immediately without being blocked. What's new about the condition variable is the concept of when an event occurs, you can choose whether you want to signal only one thread or to broadcast alerting all threads that are waiting for the event. So, I mean, how did we address this kind of problem in the past? We covered this in, uh, in the uh, discussion about uh, synchronization patterns where we talked about the uh, signaling pattern and then we got on to the rendezvous pattern and then we got on to the barrier pattern. Uh, and in the barrier pattern, we said, well, listen, whatever thread gets there last, you know, does the Oprah thing, you know, you get a signal, you get a signal, everyone gets a signal. Uh, and that's one way to tell everybody if you know how many threads are waiting. Uh, we might not know that. Uh, we also know about the turnstile pattern where each thread tells the next that you know, they're allowed to proceed, but we could avoid that with condition variable broadcast. So let's take a look at our functions for how we work with a condition variable. There's wait, signal, broadcast, as well as the initialization and destruction functions uh, as before. Uh, and these are all uh, in the pthread library, so they resemble to a certain extent you know, um, something that we are familiar with. The um, type for a pthread condition variable is pthread condition t. Uh, th that makes sense. It's consistent with the naming structure for condition variables, so that part's n nothing new. Uh, and our function uh, to create it is uh, pthread condition uh, init, which takes a pointer to the condition variable you want to initialize, uh, as well as a pointer to the attributes. It will not surprise you uh, at all to uh, learn that we will take the default attributes and we will take null, and that's fine. Down at the end, there is destroy, uh, and destroy is, uh, again, also straightforward, takes a pointer to the thing that you want to destroy. Easy. No cause for concern there. Um, now, there's wait, there's signal, and broadcast. And signal uh, resembles post. This is what I mean about naming being somewhat inconsistent. That, you know, in uh, Unix, it's sem post, and now it's c condition variable signal. Um, yep, that's just the way that it is. Uh, and uh, then we have broadcast. Broadcast is new and it you know covers um, what I was just discussing uh, a moment ago. Uh, and that is we tell everybody that's waiting that you know they are unblocked. Uh, and this broadcast idea really makes a condition variable much more interesting uh, than just the simple signaling pattern that we have covered in the past. So, okay. Um, the other thing that should stick out to us is that wait is kind of different now. Wait now takes two parameters. It takes a condition variable and it takes a mutex. So, yeah, a condition variable can't stand alone. A condition variable always has to be paired with a mutex. Uh, and the mutex is used to control access to whatever shared resource we're talking about, and the condition variable is used to tell other uh, threads, you know, or to tell waiting threads, you know, the uh, time is now. So, yeah, what's, what's with that? Um, there's a couple of rules. So, because the condition variable is always used in conjunction with this mutex, the condition wait takes both the condition variable and the mutex, and it is correct, and only correct, to call this function while the mutex is locked. So we're in the critical section, we've locked the mutex, we did some stuff, and then we're going to call condition wait with the condition variable and the mutex. It automatically releases the mutex while it waits for the condition, thus allowing other threads to have a turn to you know, enter the critical section. When the condition is true, the mutex is automatically locked again so when the thread that called condition wait uh, is reawakened uh, and then may proceed and can manually unlock when finished. Okay, that probably sounds strange. It'll look a bit 
clearer, I think, when we actually look at the example and when you see the, um, the way that it's used. But a condition variable allows you to be in a critical section and you can say, well, actually, uh, I want to suspend what I'm doing right now and let other threads do some stuff. Uh, and then eventually when whatever condition I'm waiting for is fulfilled, then I can pick up again where I left off. That's kind of interesting. I mean, like all things, it has to be done responsibly. Uh, if we you know, leave off in the middle of something and it leaves everything in an inconsistent state, we did not use it responsibly, so no cookie. But we can use it for good. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, hey guys, guess what? Uh, condition variable broadcast. Um, and you know, if you've watched TV anchors, you know how you know they always talk in, in that same way. This just in, water is wet, winter is cold, and sources suggest that two and two may, in fact, be four. Uh, maybe I miss my calling as a radio personality or something. Uh, or I'm putting you to sleep. That's probably true, too. Um, but yeah, broadcast is you know, the uh, idea that makes this kind of interesting to us. So here we have an example. Uh, and the example has been cut down a bit from its original source, original source linked in the notes, because it's actually like, very long and has you know, many, many multi-line giant comments. Uh, so I've cut it down a bit so it will fit on the slide, and you don't have to read you know, like six lines of comment before every statement, because I will tell you what the statements are, and also I assume you know what some of the statements mean without me needing to explain, you know, oh, well, if you include the pthread.h header, what does that do? Uh, so, you know, that part should be um, familiar to us by now. Okay, so we're going to have number of threads is 3, and we're going to have a count limit of 12, so we have, we're going to have different threads that count up to the limit. Uh, they count up to the increment limit, uh, and then when that happens, they will interact with the condition variable. So we have a uh, thread here that I increments counts. Actually, we'll have several, but threads that increment count run this function. Uh, and for int i equals 0, i less than 10, i plus plus, they will lock the mutex increment count. If count is at the limit, then uh, it will indicate the condition is fulfilled and send a condition signal uh, on this condition variable. Uh, and then uh, there's some printfs associated with it to make it a little... Um, a little easier to follow the execution of the program while it's going on. Unlock the mutex and then exit. Uh, and a watcher thread uh, is going to lock the mutex, check and see if the count is less than the limit. Uh, if that's the case, then we're going to wait uh, and do pthread condition wait with the threshold condition variable and the count mutex. Uh, and when we eventually get woken up again, there's a printf saying watcher has woken up and there's a block for do something useful. And we can exit from the critical section and then exit the thread. There is also a corresponding main function. It is not anything exciting. It's exactly what you would expect. Initialize your uh, condition variable, initialize your mutex, uh, create your threads, join your threads, uh, destroy the mutex, destroy the condition variables, and then exit. Okay, what makes this interesting, what makes it you know, unusual, what makes it new as compared to what we did before, uh, is that uh, for our condition variable watcher, uh, we will lock the mutex. If we get here and this condition is already fulfilled, then like, yeah, let's get out of here. We can just, you know... Um, we can just go on uh, and you know, do whatever we need to do. Um, alternatively, if it's less than that, we'll wait. So we're not going to you know, come back again later or anything like that. And you're probably thinking, well, we could just achieve this with a semaphore. Or you would say, you know, just sem wait. And then when count is this, sem post from the other thread. And you're right. But what's new here is the ability to decide to wait from inside this critical section without risking some sort of deadlock or anything like that. We can just wait, and then the condition will be fulfilled. Uh, and the same thing uh, will happen here is that you know, we will uh, lock our critical section. If a condition is fulfilled, we will signal. Great. Now, um, to clarify, just in case there's you know, a question about it, the um, so the mutex I said uh, is automatically locked again and unlocked here uh, based on the use of condition wait. So the counter thread runs uh, and it locks the mutex, and then when pthread condition wait is called, the mutex is unlocked. 
So we're in the middle of the critical section, but we've gone to sleep and we've released the mutex to allow another thread to have a turn. That will allow the incrementer threads to have a turn. When pthread condition signal happens, it doesn't mean that the other thread, the, the watcher thread, can run immediately. It has to get the mutex first. So we'll print send signal, and then when we get to pthread mutex unlock, that will allow a thread that's waiting to proceed. It could be another incrementer, but it could be the watcher. Um, but if it's the watcher, then the mutex is locked again, uh, and the uh, watch thread is allowed to continue, and it prints watcher has woken up. So, yeah, it is important to remember that when you are waiting on the condition, you are unlocking the mutex for a while. But when you uh, return to execution in the watch count thread, you will have the mutex again. Uh, it will be locked, and you have to remember to manually unlock it when done. Uh, otherwise, of course, we forget to do it. Okay, now the thing about broadcast also that makes it quite different from... Uh, the standard signaling is when you signal on a semaphore, it increments the internal counter of your general semaphore, uh, and that means the number goes up, and if a thread comes along and calls wait, well, the internal counter was still increased, so you just you know, decrement the counter, and if it's non-negative, proceed. With a condition variable, if you signal, or broadcast for that matter, but no one is listening, then the event is lost. So the condition variable, unlike the, um, unlike the semaphore, doesn't have this internal counter that is affected, by, um, is affected by the signal or the broadcast that changes its internal state such that subsequent waits uh, are using the modified state. Uh, and therefore, only threads that are waiting at the time of the broadcast are able to be woken up by that. If you were late to the party, you missed it, uh, and that leads to a problem called the lost wake-up problem. Because if threads didn't get to where they needed to be and they weren't waiting at the time, they missed the wake-up signal and they get to the condition variable and they go to sleep, uh, and you know, like Sleeping Beauty, they you know, don't wake up. No, until the prince comes along, I suppose. So, until another uh, another wake up comes along as a result of another signal or uh, or broadcast. Now, uh, the lost wake up problem. You know, using the word problem in the name perhaps sends a message that actually this is bad and it needs to be avoided at all costs. That's not necessarily the case. Um, sometimes, uh, in this case, um, you know, it's not really an issue. Uh, sometimes, uh, when you are sending out a broadcast, you're just broadcasting to anybody who's interested, and if nobody's interested right now, it's not a big deal. Uh, or if a thread misses this one, again, not a big deal, because there will be more later, uh, and that's perfectly fine. So don't don't let the name lost wake up problem like somehow convince you that uh, you know this this is definitely uh, you know going going to be a big problem, uh, and uh, somehow we have to resolve that problem under all circumstances. Not the case. Um, sometimes yeah, um, sometimes no one cares. You know you can uh, you can broadcast an event, and if no one is listening, then no one is listening, uh, and that's perfectly okay. Um, you know, TV, TV networks, I think, get mad if you know, no one is watching or anything like that. But uh, you know, you don't have to follow that. Uh, you don't have to follow that rule. So, uh, condition variable with broadcast could be redu uh, used to replace some of the synchronization constructs that we've talked about already. Um, so, I'll give you a moment to think about uh, any that we have uh, have done so far, uh, and that might include in say assignments or something to that effect. You know, that might be uh, also something you should think about. Okay. Well, in addition to uh, some of the things that we've covered already, um, what about the uh, what about the uh, barrier? Okay. 
So on the left, um, consider the barrier pattern from earlier. If you remember, this is the simple uh, single phase barrier. Um, you can expand this if you want, uh, as, as you need. Um, but there are n threads, and we wait for the last one to arrive. So I imagine you remember how this goes. So you wait on the mutex, find increment count. Uh, if count is equal to n, then post on the barrier, uh, and uh, and if, post on mutex, uh, and then wait on barrier, post on barrier, your standard turnstile pattern. Okay, uh, and that lets all of them through. So, thing about this is that's a lot of system calls. Uh, that is a lot of work uh, in which we are, you know, saying, okay, operating system, I need you to do this for me. Consider the condition variable version on the right. So you wait on the mutex, increment count. If count is less than n, we're not ready yet, so we wait. Uh, on the barrier and we release the mutex. So now barrier is a condition variable as opposed to a semaphore. Uh, and uh, then otherwise, uh, if we are in fact the last thread, then we broadcast on the barrier, post on mutex, and continue on our merry way. Okay. Um, does that look okay? Is that a way that we could successfully apply the condition variable to this? Does it seem like it does what it says it should do? Now, you should uh, agree with me, I think, if I tell you that the answer is yes. Uh, it does work as expected. Uh, that ultimately, you know, if we are the last thread, we are the last one. Okay, so we tell everybody else, you may now proceed. Uh, and now we do that in one shot. Uh, with the broadcast as opposed to repeated uh, you know, post in a for loop or uh, you know, each uh, thread then posts to the next one. So that part uh, is covered. Uh, and if we're the last thread, we don't really have to wait for anything. We can just say, hey, hey everybody, I'm here now. You know, sorry for being my you know, standard 20 minutes late. Uh, and then all the threads are allowed to proceed immediately, and the same, uh, same for this one, so it doesn't have to wait for anything. Uh, as for the other threads, if they're not the last one, then they wait on the condition variable, and they wait for the condition to be fulfilled, and the condition is the arrival of the last thread. So if the last thread has arrived, then we will get unblocked, because we were waiting. Uh, and um, so last thread will broadcast on the barrier, post on the mutex, and it'll proceed. Uh, and then the mutex will be assigned and is locked again to one of the threads that was waiting. You'll wake up, you'll immediately just leave uh, post on mutex, you know, let the next one go, and so on and so on and so on. So we've actually uh, saved ourselves quite a number of synchronization calls, uh, which hopefully reduces the amount of... Uh, uh, amount of time spent waiting for the operating system to do this and the amount of time that threads spend blocked. So yeah, it says the wait takes place before post on mutex. You know, does, does that look a little bit strange? Uh, again, that's just to, to remind you uh, that um, you don't post on mutex and then do condition wait. You, well, you have to call condition wait with the mutex being locked and you are temporarily giving up possession of that mutex in that thread such that other ones uh, are allowed. So, um, is there a risk of the lost wake-up problem here? Now, the lost wake-up problem would be slightly bad because it would imply that, you know, a thread that didn't, uh, didn't get woken up, you know, doesn't get to eat. If we're still sticking with the uh, example from much earlier about how, you know, you can't be seated at a table at the restaurant until your entire party has arrived. Okay, so we don't expect that the lost wake-up problem would be an issue here. Uh, for the lost wake-up to happen, a broadcast has to happen when at least one of the threads isn't already waiting for that broadcast. Uh, and I mean, you can imagine that wouldn't occur here. If we are not the last thread, then we don't broadcast, so we just proceed immediately to wait. Uh, and because modification and reading of count is inside this critical section of uh, wait mutex, post mutex, only one thread is actually going to execute the if count is, is equal to n block, you know, the else condition 
here. Uh, and therefore, only the last thread will broadcast. Uh, by that point, all other threads uh, will have already waited on the uh, barrier and therefore will have unlocked the mutex. If they hadn't already waited on the barrier, they wouldn't have unlocked the mutex, and therefore they couldn't uh, let another thread have a turn. Uh, so the lost wake-up problem is not at issue here. Okay. So, yeah, we're okay. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the barrier pattern uh, turned into a actual C code example. Uh, so you would have to initialize count, lock, and CV correctly. Uh, for count, uh, we would just have to initialize it to zero. Uh, and uh, lock, just pthread mutex init uh, with the pointer to lock and uh, default uh, attributes with null. Same thing for the condition variable, pthread condition init, uh, again with null for the attributes for the default. Uh, and then we have a function barrier. Okay, so barrier uh, is defined as follows, p thread mutex lock of the lock, increment count, if count is less than num threads, do this, uh, do the condition wait, otherwise broadcast, otherwise unlock. Does this work? Sure, if you use it correctly. If every thread calls barrier before they go on to whatever is supposed to happen after that, then yeah, we should expect that this is going to do the right thing. Broadcast wakes up all the other threads, if you wished, you could in theory put a for loop in there instead of uh, pthread condition broadcast. You could say for int i equals zero, i less than num threads, i plus plus, pthread condition signal on the condition variable. But why? That kind of defeats the purpose of using the condition variable as opposed to the regular semaphore, doesn't it? Uh, but the condition variable is good for this. Um, you should consider using a condition variable anytime you see behavior in the program that looks something like, you know, check the value of a variable if it is equal to or greater than or less than some particular target, then take some action. That implies a condition, uh, and a condition variable is a good match for that kind of scenario. The next thing that we want to talk about is monitor. No, wait... That's not the right kind, hashtag not sponsored. What's a monitor? Um, so a condition variable can be used in the creation of a monitor. And a monitor is a higher level synchronization construct. Um, think about this in terms of like object-oriented programming. In, in object-oriented programming, you have a class. A class is used as a way of packaging up your data and your operations that relate to that data. Uh, and that means that you, know, you can write those functions and you know, they operate on the, you know, the data of the class uh, and everything goes together as a package. Uh, and the goal of a monitor is to package up shared data and operations on that shared data so that we don't have to write any of the synchronization code ourselves. Thing is, the objective is to make it easier to write code correctly and not make mistakes. Unfortunately, there are a number of steps where you can get it wrong in your typical program. Uh, and I know we've covered examples that look like this before, but you have function foo, you know, lock a mutex, if condition, printf, cannot continue due to reasons, return, more stuff, unlock, then at the end of the function. Obviously, not every problem is this easy to see. I mean, this one is a little bit contrived because I just wrote, you know, an obvious, here's a thing that you could do wrong. Uh, and you can see very clearly, this is wrong. There's control flow where if condition is true, you could exit this function foo without unlocking mutex L. Yeah, if I cut out the actual code and just replace it with some comments, you know, read some data and more stuff, it makes it a lot more obvious. Uh, a real code example where this could happen is, you know, there could be hundreds of lines in this function. I mean, why are there hundreds of lines in your function? You should refactor it. But come on, we all know everybody has, you know, in their code base some functions that are way too long. Uh, and so you will find something like this. Uh, and you could find something that is, in fact, exactly this. So it's easy to overlook something 
when a function is so big that it gets out of control. Uh, similarly, uh, if you just sort of like uncleverly refactor things and you're like, oh, I'm just going to cut this here and move it to a different function and I'm going to do this and do that, then you might introduce some termination condition which fails to respect unlocking mutex or you might unlock a mutex two times or any number of other things which are like unfortunately the norm in C programming. So what's the goal of the monitor? I mean, it's not something that we can use a lot in C, uh, but maybe you've written using another language. Maybe a language like Java. So the idea of a monitor should be familiar to you if you've used a Java synchronization construct. In particular, Java uses the synchronized keyword. Uh, and in Java, you can declare a method to be synchronized by tagging it, you know, where you put public static void, that kind of thing, public synchronized void. Uh, synchronized means that there is a lock created around that method. Locking and unlocking is handled automatically. So to enter into this function, you have to acquire the lock. Uh, I should say you have to acquire the lock is perhaps incorrect. Uh, whichever thread it is that wants to execute this code has to acquire the lock. Uh, and then when you exit from this function, not when you call you know, some other function from within it, but when you exit this function, no matter how you exit it, <laughs> whether that is you know, with a return statement uh, or uh, when something goes wrong, you have exception, whatever it is, however you leave from this function, the lock is automatically released. And the magic, if you will, of this is that you don't have to write any lock and unlock code. You don't have to cover every path that the code could take. You don't have to make sure that whatever happens, you know, you've uh, configured a pthread cancellation handler. So if this thread you know, suffers a mysterious accident, uh, then you know, well, well, I don't know, did the mutex get unlocked? All of that is kind of skipped in this. Uh, and so that's one of the ways that you can use a monitor uh, and as long as the language supports it. Now, in Java, there's also the way where you can specify a block. Uh, instead of specifying the whole method as being synchronized, you can synchronize on an object uh, and the identity of the object in question is used. Uh, and so lock has to be acquired to enter the block and there's a critical section at the end of the synchronized block the lock is automatically released uh, and the goal of this as I say is just to simplify the process of uh, writing your multi-threaded code uh, to abstract away some of the details of how all the mutual exclusion works uh, and everything like that so it is yeah, supposed to help you uh, I mean, you can make an argument, if you wish, about whether you think this is good or bad. Um, I think uh, in a lot of situations, it is good. Uh, you want to make things as, uh, as painless as possible. You want to make things impossible to forget. Uh, but sometimes that is not an option based on the language that you are using. Uh, sometimes you really do have to do things the hard way. Uh, of course, um, that might prompt you to have questions about why this isn't C in the first place. And sometimes the hard way is good for you. Sometimes learning how to do things, you know, with the without the hand holding and with without the niceties, uh, makes you better at doing the task than it would be if uh, if Java held your hand the whole way. Now, okay, thing is, monitors don't have to be written in Java, and please don't take this as an endorsement of, you know, Java is great. Uh, I mean, other languages have it. Um, it's not exclusive to Java. But they very commonly appear in object-oriented programming languages because the concept is basically familiar. Instead of, you know, the internal data of this class being held within this class, it is now the shared data uh, that is being manipulated is held within a monitor. Uh, so it looks kind of like it. Um, moreover, because of things in object-oriented programming, like encapsulation, so you can like tag variables as private and what have you, it's a lot easier to force access to be through a specific monitor. C can't stop you from going poking around in anything. You know, oh, I, I want to look inside that struct. You can. Whether you can make any sense of it or not, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, this variable is const. I'm going to cast it. No, it isn't. Um, you know, the C compiler says, you know, I'll just do what you tell me. You know, who cares what it means? 
So it makes monitors kind of hard to enforce in that regard because you can say, oh, you should use this. Uh, and uh, okay, you know, maybe most people do, but you can't make anybody. Whereas with uh, object-oriented programming, there are ways that you can prevent access to private variables. Admittedly, in Java, that's only being really clamped down on now in, uh, in Java 11 and beyond. Uh, but in principle, there is a way that you can prevent private uh, things from being accessed. In C, we have no such niceties, uh, and we just kind of have to suffer. So, yeah, that's a little digression on the subject of monitors. Um, you'll notice we didn't really uh, you know, do any examples, do any uh, programming with one. They're not really something that happens a lot in C. Uh, I include it here for completeness reasons, uh, not because this is uh, a significant part of what we're going to uh, cover in the course uh, or uh, a significant part of uh, anything that would appear on an exam or an assignment. Uh, and uh, so after monitors, our next thing is, well, atomic types. And the last thing that we want to cover in this lecture is, well, atomic types. Uh, and uh, I've already talked about how you know, atomic in, in this sense is not uh, in the sense of atoms uh, because we're really good at blowing things up and we've found a way to split atoms uh, in all well, about 1945. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're good at making things explode. It is our core competency as a species. Um, now, uh, so what I actually want to talk about are things that are indivisible. And we've already learned that we could use the concept of locking and unlocking to make a critical section indivisible. Um, but sometimes that's not enough. So very frequently we have a code pattern that looks something like this. We lock a mutex, increment a shared variable, and then unlock. This is fully correct. There's, um, there's no flaw in this. There's no logic that's out of place. Everything is the way it should be. But you might say, well, it seems like it's a lot of work to lock and unlock the mutex. Uh, and um, this sort of thing is inefficient because there is a significant amount of work to lock and unlock the mutex and you know, with threads getting blocked and unblocked and what have you but even if they don't get blocked even if there's really you know only one thread at a time that is ever doing this uh, we're still investing a lot of time into both locking and unlocking should you take a, a future course uh, on a related subject like oh uh, i don't know programming for performance we can talk about what actually happens when you um lock a mutex like what the internal implementation is like uh, and the answer is it is expensive uh, and it sucks so it seems like we have to do a fair amount of work every single time would it be possible to skip that we learned already about test and set kind of instruction uh, and uh, you might also be familiar with something like compare and exchange uh, and the idea is well could we use that could we do that for something like incrementing a variable could we do that without having to lock and then make the modification and then unlock it afterwards? And the answer to that is yes. No, after all this buildup, I'm going to tell you, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could do this thing, but actually like, haha, no, just kidding. You know, the remaining slides are all the troll face. Of course, the answer is yes. However, we have to leave the brightly lit path and go into the dark. Now, for the most part, we've tried to the extent that's possible to talk about things that are standards compliant and they are, this is the way that things work in C uh, and this allows you to compile your code in a way that it works fine on this system or that system and it's, you know, that's the normal way you want to do things. However, atomic operations are not defined in C, at least until the C11 standard and here we are doing C99. So, uh, yeah, li living in the past is uh, occasionally fun, but it comes with disadvantages. And one of them is that there's no standardized support for atomic types. We have to use a non-standard uh, version for this. Uh, and so the GNU, the one in Linux uh, standard C library, which is called glibc, provides operations that are guaranteed to execute atomically that are guaranteed to prevent race conditions. 
So where possible, the compiler will try to turn that into an uninterruptible hardware instruction. Otherwise, behind the scenes is a fallback plan. Some sort of locking will take place to implement the atomic nature of the instruction. Uh, and uh, the types that we're going to learn about today, as I say, are not especially portable. They are, well, you know, only available in glibc. Uh, and uh, for now, that's going to have to suffice. Again, in a world where this is uh, C11, we can get away with using the uh, built-in ones, but this is all we have. So, yeah, they're not portable, um, and you can't take it with you. Uh, now, most of the systems that you will work on, you know, if you're following the instructions for how to do stuff in this course, you will be using you know, a... Um, a Ubuntu machine, which is going to be a Linux, and it uses the glib version. That's fine. Um, you will encounter difficulty if you try to run perhaps on a, a BSD environment or you're using Mac OS, so be careful. Now, um, for the specification that we are going to examine, we see type uh, written in, uh, in the uh, function signatures, both as a return type and as an argument, uh, and that is intended to just be some notational convenience. Um, you can use any valid type, so integer, short, long, whatever it is, uh, pointer, as long as it is one, two, four, or eight bytes in length, you can substitute that for the word type in the following definitions. So if you see uh, a function name and it has a return uh, value of, uh, of type and it takes an argument uh, where the you know, type of that is type, then you could substitute in integer and as long as you're consistent, that is you know, int this, int that, that works. Um, if we didn't do this, um, then the table would just be like really, really large because you would have one for uh, char, you would have one for short, you would have one for int, uh, but it would look different depending on your system because, well, maybe int isn't four bytes on your system, you know, you'd have one for pointers, but is that the four byte or the eight byte one? So it just makes the next little table um, more compact. In fact, it makes it uh, so that these things will fit on the screen because if I tried to show you them all, it wouldn't work. So to set a value, our very first function is, uh, well, it's test and set. The name is unfortunate because it conflicts with our earlier understanding of the test and set hardware instruction, but I can't do anything about that. So sync lock test and set, you just have to know is distinct from regular test and set. So if we want to set a value, we can use this function type, uh, and then we have two underscores. It is frequently the case that if you see something with two underscores, that means that it is some non-standards compliant, you know, implemented only by your library. It's a hint that you are wandering off the path uh, and into the woods. You don't necessarily get in danger by doing that, but you should be aware that uh, what you're doing comes at a slight cost. So sync lock test and set takes two arguments, a pointer to a type, uh, and then a value. So, and the value also has to be of the same type. So you can replace type in this expression with any of the valid types, you know, one, two, four, or eight bytes in length, uh, as long as it's an integral type, so it can't be a floating point number, or it can't be a fixed precision you know, uh, decimal number, anything like that. It has to be an integer type uh, or a pointer. Pointers are also integral types as, uh, as far as we're concerned. So you could say, uh, use the function uh, with int, uh, and then it would be int sync lock test and set int star pointer int value. And that would be a valid usage. That would work. You would set the value to the new value atomically. So you want to assign 42, that's how you do it. The following functions are used to swap two values, uh, only if the old value matches the expected, that is what is provided as the second argument, old val. Uh, so uh, there's a boolean version and there's a type version, so sync bool um, compare and swap and sync val compare and swap, uh, just to differentiate them. Uh, uh, boolean tells you if you succeeded, val returns the old value if you cared. Um, but in this case, um, you take as your arguments type, so the thing that you want to change, 
the old value, that's the expected value, and the new value, that is the next value. So um, compare and swap is also called compare and exchange sometimes, uh, and this is used for scenarios where you want to update something. Uh, and one of the most common ones that I can think of off the cuff is something like you want to update the head of a linked list. Well, you want to make sure that nobody beat you to the punch. Uh, and so for that, you can use compare and swap to check and see is the value the expected value. If it is, then it hasn't changed in the meantime, and we can you know, proceed. The swap will take place if the old value is out of date. Uh, at the time when the compare and swap function runs, then it actually fails, you know, returns false, or um, uh, otherwise doesn't make the swap. Uh, and you are told, uh, in that sense, our operation was unsuccessful. So compare and swap can be used also for test and set, if you are so inclined, uh, although it's not something that... Uh, uh, that we usually need because, well, test and set is perfectly efficient for the job that it's intended for. Okay, um, there are also some value uh, where you can you know, add, subtract, or, like bitwise or, bitwise and, uh, xor, nand, uh, and they come in two variants. They come with the return the old value version and return the new value version. If you don't care about the uh, old value or the new value or anything you just need to like assign a variable or add something to a variable you could use either one and you can ignore the return value that's perfectly fine um, but their names sort of imply what they do so fetch and add returns the old value add and fetch returns the new value uh, and these are again all atomic operations so it says I want you to go to this pointer and add this value so again if you imagine them as, as being with uh, short so you would use sync, fetch, and add with a pointer to a short, uh, and you would add the value contained in the short of the second argument. So the pointer currently contains 8, and I want to add 15 to it. Great, put them together, uh, and it sets the value as 23. If you used fetch and add, it returns 8. If you use add and fetch, it returns 23. Uh, and you also get fetch and subtract. Uh, so um, you could argue actually the fetch and subtract is useless because you could just add a negative number. You know, given a type, you could just say value times minus one. Sure, same difference, just notational convenience. Uh, and then there are the bitwise operations for uh, or, and, xor, nand. So um, we should be familiar with those kind of logic values. I don't think you need me to. Uh, explain those to you, um, but those are most commonly used in situations where the pointer that we're looking at is being used as a bit field. Uh, so if you ever wanted to use a character as a bit field, um, then you can certainly do that um, where you, know, you have a character and you use one of these uh, operations where you do like some bitwise or, uh, or bitwise and, uh, and this allows you to do it atomically, sort of without locking and unlocking. So, okay. We've covered a few things. We've covered what is effectively assignment. Uh, so that, you know, that is you know, the sync lock test and set function, great. Uh, and well, we've covered a number of operations for um, modifying, we can add, we can subtract, we can do bitwise stuff. What about read? What about read? Um, so interestingly for x86 there is no built-in or glibc provided atomic read operation the answer to that is the reason for that is because read is atomic for 32-bit aligned data by default if you just say x is assigned y and those are two values that are 32-bit aligned then um, that is by default atomic because it's accomplished in one hardware instruction and you don't have to worry that anything could go wrong there's two problems with that. One, this behavior is specific to x86 architecture, so you shouldn't rely on that. We're trying very hard to not rely on um, not rely on specific hardware. You know, making an assumption that it runs on x86 uh, instruction set. Um, the other thing is you could potentially get an out of date value. Um, if you rely on this behavior. And the second caveat to that is that um, it has to be 32-bit aligned. 
you're not necessarily given a super strong guarantee that any data you're looking at is 32-bit aligned. I mean, you can look at its memory address and like do the division and you know try to figure it out, but why? Don't make your life crazy. In particular, if you're looking at an array or something, like you, know, you can't be sure. If it's a field in a struct, you don't know. Um, we haven't gone into um, the details about packing of, of structures because that kind of thing is left to, uh, again, a future course, programming for performance. Uh, put another dollar in the swear jar. At the end of this, uh, I'm going to be able to throw myself quite a party. Um, but uh, things like, well, you know, your array allocation, you know, how big are elements in the array, what what is the order of operations um, on this array, how do things look in your struct, all of those are way too advanced for what we want to talk about in this course. So although you might read in your documentation that, oh, a, a read for you know, x86 is atomic for 32-bit aligned data, I say don't trust it. What you should do is you use one of the above functions and you just add or subtract zero. That gives you the value, and adding zero does no damage, subtracting zero does no damage. Uh, and it skips over any of the concerns about is this x86 specific and is your data 32-bit aligned. That also makes it one notch more portable. So that's my recommendation for if you just wanted to do an atomic read, that's how I would do it. For true portability, obviously, um, you need to use C11 uh, or a semaphore or mutex or anything, uh, anything like that. So to give you a uh, concrete example of using atomic types, I want to go back to an earlier example uh, where we were learning about pthreads. Uh, and you will remember, I think, this program uh, as being uh, one, of the, uh, one of the early ones where I demonstrated a problem with shared data. Uh, and we have sum as a global variable, and we have a function runner. We create three threads, and we join them. Uh, and then the runner threads uh, count up to some value, and they all modify sum. Right, so this program, again, should be fairly familiar to you, and you'll remember, I think, also what happened when we compile it and run it. Uh, and I will compile it quickly. Uh, and if we run it, you know, with a small value, um, we get consistent behavior. That's fine, but if I make the number bigger, if I make it 100,000, then this produces inconsistent results because we have race conditions uh, with regard to the shared variable sum. So, okay, um, how do we fix that? Well, I mean, up till now, our only real option for that would be something along the lines of here. Uh, when it comes to line 34, we'd say, well, we need a mutex for this code. Uh, and sure enough, I mean, that will work if I put, you know, pthread mutex lock and pthread mutex unlock. And uh, I'll have to declare the mutex and uh, initialize it and destroy it and everything, you know, that would work. However, this falls exactly into the um, kind of situation that I was talking about when I introduced this topic about how it's kind of miserable to do that because we're in this very tight for loop where we will, you know, on every iteration of the loop, lock the mutex, do this one thing, you know, plus equals i, okay, it's more than one thing, otherwise we wouldn't have this problem, but we would do one uh, one group of operations, which is fairly short, and then we would unlock, so we'd have a lot of entries and exits from the critical section. So we could replace that with atomics. Uh, and I've already prepared that version, so we can just uh, look to that and we can skip it. Uh, skip watching me type it, you know, copy and paste the file. And the only change between the two files is here at line 34, uh, where instead of adding i to sum with sum plus equals i, now I use sync fetch and add, uh, and we need a pointer to sum. It's a global variable, so I use address of, uh, and then i as the second argument. Um, uh, and in fact, you can see that uh, if we use diff here, uh, it, it, the diff tool will tell you actually this is the only change between the two files um, that on uh, 
P thread four at, uh, at line 34, at sum plus equals I, and here uh, it is the sink, fetch, and add. So does that solve the problem? Well, yes, but you want to see that in action, don't you? Okay, so just as a sanity check, you know, with a thousand, it works out just fine. Uh, and we saw with pthread four, we saw there were problems when we used a hundred thousand. Uh, and so uh, now we will find that every run is consistent, and we can pump it up a bit. You know, I can uh, pick a bigger number, and again, uh, we will get consistent results. Okay, our results are getting consistently weird now because we have uh, an integer overflow. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this is uh, this was already a problem when we were using a million. Uh, if we scroll back here, um, that uh, you know this number is quite close to the uh, maximum value for a signed integer, uh, and the fact that this number is somehow smaller should be concerning. Why does that happen? Well, it happens because we have an integer overflow, uh, and that's what happens here as well. But our answer is always consistent, so we've at least got that going for us. Uh, now, you might also wonder, um, if I uh, look at the code here, um, we didn't uh, actually take the, um, take the value here. Uh, we just said, yeah, I want to add it. So you're probably wondering, what is the returned value? So I will make, you know, int changed is assigned this. Uh, and then I will add a printf here so we can view it just so we have an idea we can make it a small number because it doesn't matter very much um, but we'll see um, that as as we go about it uh, it is going to be the return value it's whatever the uh, new value of that uh, variable is so it returns the changed value hence why I named it changed uh, but I will delete that and it's printf here because we don't actually need it. Okay, so I mean we could do the same thing with subtract and bitwise operations as well. Um, but this gives you just sort of a very simple comparison of this is a way to apply our atomic types uh, and how to actually like put it into, into proper usage uh, and replace what would otherwise be a... Uh, lock and then your operation and then an unlock with a one-liner that is in principle more efficient if hardware supports it than it otherwise would be now maybe your immediate thought is that you know make everything atomic why did we learn about semaphores okay semaphores have a different use why did we learn about mutex for critical sections let's get rid of everything Okay, so let's imagine that we have a uh, structure that looks like this point. It has uh, two, two variables here, volatile int x and volatile int y. Um, volatile, again, is used to tell the compiler, don't trash this, I need it. Um, it has a couple of other strange side effects, um, but we shouldn't focus on that too much. Um, but here we do a uh, test and set. We're going to assign x to 0, and we're going to assign uh, y to 0 and, uh, from point P1. Uh, and somewhere else in the program, we will atomically assign x to 25 and y to 30, uh, again, for, uh, for the same point P1. We have to imagine it's the same point. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there's kind of no question about it. So um, does this work? Does this do what it's supposed to do? I mean, I'm guessing at this point uh, in the uh, lecture material, you've probably got the metagame worked out pretty well. So if I'm asking you a question about does this work, you have a, an idea about what the answer might be. Uh, and in this case, yeah, the answer is no, this doesn't work. And why not? I mean, the right of X can succeed um, and you know, if in a different thread uh, another uh, right of x takes place, any individual right might be atomic, but the group is not. So if we view uh, setting the uh, two values of this point, you know, x and y, to both be 0 as a group, 
the group is not atomic because you know, the uh, second set of statements could happen in between at any time. So that means that invalid states could become visible. Um, so the state could be uh, incorrect. Um, you could see some invalid state like 25-0 or 0-30, where it seems like something happened part way, but you know, not actually. So we have to be very careful with what we do with atomics. Um, if you need more than one thing to you know, take place in the same package, so to speak, then a mutex type is an appropriate choice. Even if it's just, you know, X is this and Y is that, uh, then it is you know, necessary and appropriate to do that with a mutex. Uh, atomics are you know, most useful when we're only modifying one variable at a time. So if our critical section is tiny, then this will work. Um, but tiny in this case really means like one statement. Okay, now maybe you can cheat the system a little bit. You can cheat the system. If you want to play the game on hard mode, you could say, well, what if both int x and y are we'll say four bytes uh, and then you know, we could actually do something very clever where we you know, set them you know treating them as if they're one variable of size eight you know, so a long could you do something super clever like that the answer is yes but it will probably come and bite you at some point because again we are you know burning a certain amount of code portability by saying, well, now our code can only work on systems where we're certain that integer is eight bytes, or integer is four bytes and not eight bytes. So you gotta be careful. Um, you know, uh, any like magic trick like that comes at a cost, uh, and sometimes that cost is like many months down the line. You are trying to debug this program and you can't figure out why this doesn't work, uh, and it turns out because you know you put in somewhere in your program an implicit assumption uh, about what the sizes of different types are, and that assumption no longer holds for some reason. So be careful. When you play with fire, you can get burned. Okay, um, slight digression on the subject of like not doing bad things aside, uh, I will talk about one more tool that's uh, related to our uh, sort of advanced synchronization constructs. It's not technically a condition variable, a monitor, or an atomic type. It's kind of an orphan uh, amongst our concurrency topics. So it just appears here at the very end of this one. Uh, and another common technique for protecting a critical section, at least in Linux, is the spin lock. Uh, and this is a handy way to implement constant checking to acquire a lock. So you want to enter a critical section. Normal behavior is that, you know, you would just wait on a semaphore or wait on a mutex and you can get blocked uh, and you will eventually get unblocked when it's your turn. But unlike a semaphore, a spin lock doesn't do this. A spin lock is like try lock in a loop. So we try to acquire the lock uh, and if we are successful, we proceed. If not, we try again. Well, that sounds kind of crazy. I mean, when... You know, why, why would you want this? Why, why does this make sense? When would you ever want this kind of behavior? Well, one scenario where this is useful is when it's worth it. Usually it's better to let another thread execute and not waste CPU time constantly checking if it's our turn. However, if the amount of time waiting on the lock might be very small, th you know, then it might be worth it for the spin lock because blocking a process and switching to another, you know, unblocking it and switching back and what have you is expensive. Now, that takes time, you know, it, it takes effort to do that. And so when we're looking at a critical section that is very short, uh, whether it is you know, the, uh, the one where we can replace it with a one-line atomic statement, but we don't, uh, or we have you know, two or three atomic statements or something like that, we can easily take a look at that and say, well, the problem is that the amount of time that a thread is going to get blocked waiting for this critical section is probably very small, right? There are like three assignment statements inside, the, uh, inside this block, uh, inside this critical section, and three assignment statements are likely to be completed very quickly. 
uh, and you know very quickly is you know within a single digit number of CPU cycles, not you know the hundreds if not thousands of CPU cycles it takes to switch between processes. And in fact, you can put a number to it if you know how long it takes to switch between processes. So that includes save the state of the previous one and for the scheduler to run uh, and then uh, restore the state of another process and what have you. You can put a number on it when a spin lock is actually worth your while. Uh, and so spin locks you know, have just two functions, spin lock with the lock, I don't say spin lock type, uh, and there is a spin unlock when you're done. Uh, and that's straightforward um the internal implementation of a spin lock is nothing special it is just you know, an integer that's checked by a thread if it's zero uh we basically do a test and set kind of thing we can lock it and set it to one if it's non-zero then we just keep trying to do our test and set until it becomes zero so <laughs> there's no real magic in a spin lock uh, but it gets the job done um, in addition to that, there are readers writers spin locks. Um, they work on a similar principle to the readers writers lock that we have discussed earlier. The um, difference is instead of having a um, instead of having a internal counter, uh, there's actually two internal counters. There's counter and there's flag. Uh, flag you could think of as being indicating whether the room has the lights turned on or not. So if flag is one, it means nobody is in the room, the lights are off. If flag is zero, it means someone is in the room, the lights are on. And counter counts the number of readers. Uh, and there's some 24-bit reader counter. Uh, and uh, so if counter is zero and flag is one, there's no readers and the lights are off. So the spin lock is available for anyone to acquire. If counter is zero and flag is zero, it means there are no readers, but the lights are on. So someone has acquired it for writing. If n is greater than zero and flag is zero, it means there are n, writer, uh, n readers in the room right now. Uh, and you can't have uh, n greater than zero and flag being one because that would indicate that the lights are off, but there are readers in the room and that wouldn't work. They can't read in that scenario. So yeah, the uh, spin lock and its, uh, its associated readers writers uh, version uh, can of course be explored by reading the kernel documentation if you are interested in them. They, like some of the atomic types that we talked about, aren't super portable, but they're kind of a niche thing that has its use when you need it. Uh, and it is useful, again, when we have a very small critical section, but not so small that we could replace it with an atomic type uh, or an atomic operation. So that wraps up uh, our discussion of, uh, of the uh, condition variables, monitors, atomic types, spin locks, those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, this does not uh, mark the end of our concurrency topic though, so we'll pick that up again uh, in the next video. See you there.